Chapter 9, Sunday Visitors Miss Ballard was young and pretty, with a friendly smile, but I was wary as I answered her questions about myself. I'm going to watch you do some exercises, she said, so I'll know how to best help you. Oh, here it comes, I thought. More torture time. To my surprise, each time Miss Ballard asked me to move an arm or a leg, she said, please. When I did a good job, she said, that's good. You're doing great. I did arm and hand movements, followed by leg and foot movements, and each time Miss Ballard praised my efforts, even when I wasn't able to do everything she asked me to. Just one more time, she said. She sat me up in bed with my feet flat against the footboard and put her hand on the back of my head. She saved the worst for last, I thought, remembering how, hurt, how it hurt my back and hamstring muscles when Mrs. Crabbe shoved my head towards my knees. I shut my eyes, determined not to cry in front of my roommates. Let me know when this starts to hurt, she said. I want to stretch your muscles and keep them loose, but I don't want you to feel real pain. My eyes popped open. You don't? I said. Of course not. I could hardly believe my ears. Miss Ballard pushed slowly, applying gentle, steady pressure. Even when it began to hurt, I didn't tell her right away. Knowing that she would stop when I asked her to, I let her push a tiny bit farther, and from then on, I always let her go a little beyond the point where it hurt, so I could get well that much faster. Miss Ballard was lavish with praise for my efforts. She even listened to my knock-knock jokes. Soon I looked forward to daily physical therapy. I got a wheelchair and was allowed to sit up for an hour at a time. I was especially glad that I could be wheeled to the bathroom instead of using a bedpan. I called my wheelchair my iron horse, kind of like the Lone Ranger. I named my horse Silver. Each time I got into the wheelchair, I yelled, Hi-yo, Silver, away! And whacked the side of the palm with and walk the side with the palm of my hand. The sheltering arms allowed visitors twice a week, on Wednesday evenings and on Sundays from noon until four. My home in Austin was a two hour drive, so Wednesday evenings were out of the question for my parents. The first Sunday, I could hardly wait for 12 o'clock. I combed my hair twice, gobbled my lunch. My parents are coming today, I told the nurse as I handed her my lunch train. You hope, said Alice. They'll be here, I said. It's Sunday. It's sleeting, Alice pointed out. The roads are going to be terrible. From my bed, I peered anxiously out the window at the icy rain. Alice was right. The roads were probably slick. But surely, I thought, Mother and Dad would call if they were not coming. So I wouldn't worry about them. They'll be here, I repeated, trying to convince myself as well as Alice. Promptly at noon, Mother and Dad swept in the door, their arms full of bags and packages. What a nice, bright room, Mother said. Oh, when you have roommates your own age, how wonderful. The introductions were made and I opened the packages. There were extra pajamas, more books, a box of stationery with envelopes already stamped. <gasps> potato chips, I shouted. The hospital never serves potato chips, said Renee. Dad pried open the can and I began to munch. Mother passed the can to the other girls. Even more welcome than potato chips was news from home. The Usums had a new car. Mrs. Neary had opened an antique shop. Steve Gentle was taking piano lessons. I listened eagerly, and so did Dorothy, Renee, Shirley, and Alice. Midway through the afternoon, it began to irritate me that I wasn't able to talk alone with my parents. If Dad said something funny, everyone laughed. Why did my roommates have to listen to every word? Didn't they know it wasn't polite to eavesdrop on other people's conversation? The moment I asked myself the question, I knew the answer. I was the only one who had visitors. I'd assume that all the girls would have company on Sundays. Well, except for Alice, of course. Apparently, Mother had the same thought because she turned to the other girls and asked, Are any of you expecting visitors? Oh, it's too far for my family to come, Shirley said. They've only been here twice. Twice in seven months. My parents try to come once a month, Dorothy said, but it depends on whether they can get someone to do chores for them. What about you? Mother asked Renee. Will you be having visitors today? Renee shook her head. I live more than 200 miles away, she said. My parents would like to come every week, but it's not possible. Then, as if to prove that her family did not neglect her, she added, They write to me, though. I get lots of mail. Last, Mother turned to Alice. Don't ask, I thought, but Mother did. I don't get company, Alice said. Not ever? Dad asked. One of my brothers came once, but when he saw how ugly I am, he never came back. You aren't ugly, Dad said. You're pretty. Ha! <laughs> said Alice. We'll visit all of you next Sunday, Mother said, and we'll bring treats for everyone. What would you like? Dad asked. Renee, what should we bring for you? 
After some thought, Renee asked for a comic book. Little Lulu, she said, or Archie and Veronica. Surely, Mother said. What can we bring for you? Shirley replied instantly, a bag of marshmallows. Plain old marshmallows, Dad asked. I love marshmallows, Shirley said, the big puffy kind. Dorothy couldn't decide. I know what she really wants, Renee said, a tall, dark, handsome young man. While the rest of us laughed, Dorothy pulled the covers over her head, and when we quit laughing, she said, do you think I could have some licorice? Alice refused to ask for a special treat. There must be something you'd like us to bring for you, Dad said. Something you can't get here at Sheltering Arms? Alice shook her head. At first, I thought she was being ornery. And then I realized Alice had been at the Sheltering Arms for so long, she didn't really remember things like comic books and marshmallows. Licorice and potato chips were beyond her realm of experience. She didn't know what to ask for because she didn't know what was missing. A window of understanding opened in my mind and a breeze of compassion blew in. From that moment on, I was glad to share my visiting family with my roommates. And if you don't know what you want, Mother told Alice, we'll just surprise you. The next Sunday, the other girls were excited about visiting day. Alice combed her hair, though she quit when she saw me watching her. Once again, Mother and Dad came in right at 12 o'clock. They hugged and kissed me and greeted all the other girls. Did you remember our treats? Renee asked. Of course, Mother said. She handed Renee a little Lulu comic book. Dad opened Shirley's bag of marshmallows and put one in her mouth. Yum, Shirley said. That's the first marshmallow I've had in seven months. Here's your gift, Alice, Mother said, and she gave Alice a pink lipstick. Why are you being so nice to me? Alice asked. We like you, Mother said. Alice didn't say thank you, but she put the lipstick carefully away in her drawer. Dorothy's next, Renee said. Where's her tall, dark, handsome young man? Dad went into the doorway and motioned to someone in the hall. In walked my brother, Art. Art was 18 and six foot two with thick, dark hair. He was once voted campus dreamboat by a sorority group. After Art hugged me, he said, I didn't come to visit you. I came to see Dorothy. So which one of you is Dorothy? Dorothy blushed as red as a wagon while the rest of us squealed in our delight. This is for you, Art said, and he gave Dorothy a bag of licorice. Every Sunday after that, all of us chatted happily as we waited for my parents to arrive. Each Sunday at four, I hated to see them leave. The afternoons together were such fun and it would be a whole week until I saw them again. But when I started to feel sorry for myself, I looked across the room at Atlas. I only had to wait one week before my parents returned and hers were never coming back. What's cool is that now that we're midway through the book, we have some pictures because remember, this is a true story right here. So let's look at some of the pictures. It says, my hospital roommates, Alice on the left, and Dorothy. An iron lung at the University of Minnesota Hospital, and Miss Ballard helping an unidentified patient. So this is her physical therapist, Miss Ballard, down here, helping out a patient. And then up here, this is what an iron lung looks like. So this is what Tommy's head was poking through to help him breathe. It says Shirley and Dorothy. So here are her other roommates, Shirley and Dorothy. Renee left, Dorothy in the center, and me, Christmas at Sheltering Arms. So this is them celebrating Christmas. And here's our last page of pictures. This is her brother, Art the campus dreamboat, and then her parents. So that's a lot to take in. All right, tell me what happened in the chapter. What thoughts do you have and what feelings do you have?